Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. You know what's even better? Spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Welcome to Freestyle Friday, where I get to do what I want. Time for more how the sausage is made or wine is made videos. I said this a million times already, but no BS, just straight talk about how wine is made. I'm going to strip away the romance and pull back the curtain, if you will. Be that anonymous magician that shows you how the trick is done. Not to put down how wine is made or shame anyone, but this is reality. We're almost done. I have one more subject to talk about before I wrap up all these videos we've been watching. The subject, natural wine. All right, so while natural wine isn't a farming practice, it is a way to make wine that is associated with certain farming practices. Instead of making it a footnote to them, I decided to dedicate an entire episode to what it is. I'll also discuss some of the challenges that natural winemaking brings. So let's define it. Natural wine is... Uh, hmm. Well... Huh. There is no definition. Seriously, it's anything a winemaker decides to call it. I somewhat jokingly refer to it as the laziest, dirtiest way to make wine. This is an exaggeration, but it's also true at the same time. There's no legal framework in any country to define it. In South Africa, they use the term of natural wine to describe a normal wine. As far as I know, the term natural wine cannot be used on a label anywhere in the world. Okay, so maybe there's a small country somewhere that doesn't prohibit its use, but basically you can't use that term. You can use similar words to describe your wine, but some of these words have specific definitions. Most of the time, if a word that is similar to natural appears on the label, it's not a natural wine, at least not in how we view a natural wine. But words like that are allowed. You may have seen things like naked wine or raw wine. I've recently seen a lot of advertising for clean wine. I literally do not know what they mean by these terms. I mean, they do, but these don't have any actual meaning. With that said, I'll quote Wikipedia's introduction to their natural wine entry. Quote, Although there is no uniform definition of natural wine, it is usually produced without the use of pesticides or herbicides and with few or no additives. Typically, natural wine is produced on a small scale using traditional rather than industrial techniques and fermented with native yeast. In its purest form, Natural wine is simply unadulterated fermented grape juice with no additives in the winemaking process. Right, already we see we have words like usually, few, typical, etc. The last part, natural wine is simply unadulterated fermented grape juice with no additives, is the image that is being presented to us. Hell, most people think that bottle of Naomi is made this way. And that's perfectly normal. How many of us actually know how the sausage is made for any product. We maybe know the raw ingredients and then by some kind of magic out pops that container of product. Maybe we know a nugget or two about how a product is made from a TV show or we saw an article about what the acceptable level of some kind of substance is for a product. And that substance seems a bit gross or has a scary name. So from that point on, we associate that with all of those specific products. Sulfites is one of those associated with wine. I'll eventually have an episode about sulfites, but for now, it's going to be just a part of the discussion here. Okay, so if there is no definition of natural wine, can we have some kind of agreement on the typical process? Maybe? That Wikipedia quote gives us some guidance. Let's start with the raw materials. Grapes. Grapes should be at least farmed organically, maybe biodynamically, even regeneratively even via regenerative agriculture. Definitely no natural winemaker worth his wine would use conventionally farmed grapes. At least I would hope not. That winemaker is almost always certainly going to be growing them rather than purchasing, but I could see a winemaker buying from a trusted wine grower. As far as the viticulture, the image would be that there is minimal work happening in the vineyard. Some winter pruning, maybe some canopy management, and then harvest. In reality, there is probably more hands-on happening. For sure, it's all done by hand or with animals. Using an actual gas-powered piece of equipment would only make sense if the winemaker just doesn't have enough help to accomplish everything in the vineyard. 
A common thing is to combat fungi in the vineyard. What are known as the Bordeaux mixture and its cousin the Burgundy mixture can be used for the most part. I talked about these in the organic episodes, but I'll briefly repeat them here. Bordeaux mixture is a combination of copper sulfate and quicklime. The Burgundy mixture is also based on copper sulfate, but is combined with sodium carbonate instead. Both are used as a fungicide. They prevent downy mildew, powdery mildew, and other fungi. Both are effective and touted as an organic pesticides, and technically they are. However, there's always too much of a good thing. It has been found to be toxic in high concentrations. Created in Bordeaux, hence the name, in the late 19th century, many years of use there and elsewhere in Europe has created a larger issue. Copper toxicity. Copper levels build over the years, which increases the toxicity of the soil and the resultant water supply from groundwater and runoff into streams and rivers. This is a real concern in places that have been using it for over 100 years. And while I mentioned that there are synthetic alternatives, organic farming tries to avoid synthetics as much as possible. So while I can see a natural winemaker using it since it qualifies as an organic pesticide, my guess is that it would only be used if there was no other way to deal with the fungi. In addition to this, a natural winemaker is probably doing all the other things an organic or biodynamic winemaker is doing in the vineyard cover crops, composting, using animals for pest and weed management along with compost creation, biodynamic teas or treatments, water management, and others. Like I said, there really isn't a natural way of farming other than using something like organics, bio, or regenerative. Okay, so we harvest the grapes. In this case, we'll assume hand harvest since that's how they used to do it. Plus, it's more ecologically friendly. However, this will increase the cost to make the wine. Then you need to get the juice. Well, if we're really old school, then you're doing foot treading, but I'm going to guess that most natural wine is not going to do this. Since there will probably be hundreds or maybe thousands of cases or bottles, some kind of press will be used, depending on where it is in the winemaking process. Also during this time, the winemaker may be deciding whether to include stems or not. I won't get into all the reasons either way, but it's more likely that stems will be included. Now that we have the juice, the natural winemaker is going to use native yeast. There's nothing preventing the use of commercial yeast, but it defeats the purpose of a wine being natural to do this. To be truly natural, this fermentation known as primary fermentation will not be artificially temperature controlled and will be an open top fermenters to allow that native yeast to do its job. You can have the fermentation room underground like a barrel cellar to keep things cooler, but you'll need to have sufficient ventilation for the CO2 that gets produced. You can have an air conditioned room with good ventilation too. The problem with not using temperature control is that you run the risk of stuck fermentations or a fermentation that proceeds too fast and too hot. This is one of the most critical parts of the winemaking process. The length and temperature of the fermentation will greatly influence the final product. So what's a natural winemaker to do with a stuck fermentation? In the case of a biodynamic wine, the Demeter organization will allow non-native rescue yeast to be used to restart the fermentation. You have to fill out a form uh, detailing various information, such as bricks level and temperature, then submit it to them justifying the use of the yeast. Then wait for approval while your wine is being fermented. If it gets rejected, then you can't use their logo. Like I mentioned in the biodynamic winemaking episode, yeast nutrients are not allowed except in relation to a stuck fermentation. I'd imagine the same holds true for most natural winemakers. It's not that adding something like DAP or things like micronutrients is bad, it's just another instance of not holding true to being natural. Other things can go wrong during fermentation. The formation of Britannomyces, aka Brett. This was also talked about in the biodynamic winemaking episode. This can happen in a few spots during winemaking, but it's most likely going to happen here. This is a type of yeast. It's everywhere too. It also, it's also what gives lambic beers their character. If Britannomyces doesn't get overwhelmed by other native yeasts, then it can create off aromas. Things like Band-Aid, horse sweat, barnyard, leather. Some of these are considered good, like leather. Too much becomes a fault and makes the wine undrinkable. Brett can occur in all wines. It's most often associated with French wines. If the nutrient balance isn't right, Brett can form. But the biggest reason for Brett is poor sanitation of equipment, especially what's being used to ferment the must. This is where I get the dirty part of natural winemaking. To be fair, just about every winemaker understands the importance of sanitation in the winery. However, in the effort to be 
natural, a winemaker may decide not to use anything other than water to clean the equipment. This can work for most of the time, but yeast is persistent. Volatile acidity, or nail polish remover, can also be more likely to appear in a natural wine. It's caused by a bacteria, and oxygen is the fuel for it to grow. This characteristic is considered normal for many Italian red wines, however. So this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It can occur at any point during the winemaking process. It is also most associated with fermentation. Nutrient deficiencies are a major cause. In order to combat this, you need to limit a wine's exposure to oxygen through various methods in addition to monitoring nutrients. There are a lot of other wine faults that can happen to any wine, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but I will cover two that are particularly associated with natural wines, mouse and rope, or mousiness and ropiness. Both of these can occur during malolactic fermentation, but mousiness can also occur during primary fermentation in the presence of brett. This secondary fermentation is from a naturally occurring bacteria called lactobacillus. It's what changes malic acid to lactic acid. Alcohol is not a byproduct. Going through mallow helps soften a wine, but doesn't necessarily reduce the acidity of a wine. Lactic acid is the main acid in milk, uh, is less acidic and softer than malic acid the main acid in grapes, I'm sorry, in apples. Mouse taint has no smell in the glass. It's kind of weird and cool at the same time. You can't detect it until you put the wine in your mouth. Our saliva has a higher pH than wine. When the wine hits the saliva, all these chemical reactions happen and one of them creates the compounds associated with mouse taint. It can come across as mouse cage, mouse urine, or mouse breath. Though I don't know how anyone knows what that smells like. It can also come across like a pungent cheese. <laughs> mouse cheese. Yeah, that's how it happened to me when I encountered it. I kind of liked it, to be honest, though I don't know if I could drink multiple glasses of that. It was interesting. I likened it to playing with a new toy. Interesting for a while, but then you get bored with it. Ropiness is really weird. Like mouse, it has no smell in the glass. It also has no taste. It's more of a mouthfeel. It occurs during mallow. What happens is that the lactic acid bacteria create these long saccharide, saccharide chains in the wine. They can look like strings or even rope when being poured out of the bottle. It also appears slimy or oily and can be compared to egg whites. Just because a wine seems viscous or oily doesn't mean it has rope taint. Viognier naturally produces an oily texture as a wine. This is different. If a winemaker notices this early, like still in the tank, then agitating the wine will help. The big issue is that this is rare to see prior to bottling. It can take months for ropiness to form in a wine and usually happens after it has been bottled. It doesn't affect the taste of the wine at all. It just looks gross and feels weird when you drink it. I've had one wine like this and I didn't like it. Supposedly ropiness will eventually go away over time. How long? No way to tell. Also no way to tell at which point it will present itself in the bottle. So why don't normal wines really ever have these two faults? sanitation and filtering at bottling. So we've gotten to the fining and filtering part. Many natural wines will skip this, or they may do the fining part but skip the filtration. Well, why? It's part of the concept of letting a wine naturally be made. Filter Fining alters the wine. It strips flavors and aromas, according to some. In theory, they are right, but in practice, I doubt it's that much of a change. You can naturally let large particles in a wine settle to the bottom of the tank or other vessel. You'll then draw off the clearer wine to another vessel. Most of the time you clean out the first one and refill it. This is a normal part of winemaking is called racking or rack and return. Think of it as having a 5,000 liter decanter, but it never leaves the ground. So while a winemaker may not be technically finding a wine using rack and return, they're still looking to eliminate most of the haziness in a wine. To get rid of all the haziness, you need to filter. Various size filters can be used. If we are a natural winemaker that is going to filter, then it's going to be as coarse as possible. In other words, the filter will only stop the more visible stuff. The winemaker can do whatever they want. They can use a small micron filter too, but like with finding, most natural winemakers feel using a filter is stripping away too much of the character of the wine. I wouldn't know, I've since I've never done a side-by-side -side comparison of wines that were not fined and or filtered with wines that were. I mean, that's the exact same wine. The thing is, filtration is one of the best ways to eliminate any yeast or bacteria that can create mouse and ropiness, among other problems after bottling. 
What else can a winemaker do to prevent this? Well, SO2 is the great sterilizer when it comes to wine. And natural winemakers avoid SO2 like the plague. They're not believers in the sulfite headache myth, but they believe that sulfite dulls the wine. Okay, well, maybe some of them believe the myth, but I'm pretty sure none of them do. They also feel it alters the wine too much. Many natural wines will have no added sulfites, like a 100% USDA organic wine. That doesn't mean it's a natural wine, it just means they didn't add any sulfites. Many, however, will add the bare minimum to prevent spoilage. SO2 is an antioxidant, and many of these faults are caused by oxidation. It's frustrating because oxygen is both friend and foe to wine. Lack of it can cause rotten egg smells. These usually blow off and the wine will be fine in as little as a few seconds. Too much creates faults, especially that vinegar smell or just an oxidized aroma to the wine. Just right, everything stays in balance. I get what the goal of a natural winemaker is. Let the wine speak for itself and all that. And when everything works just right, the wines are just fine. They will taste as good as any other wine. They'll maybe even have a different character. And if you know it's a natural wine, your mind may convince you that it tastes better. It's when things don't go as planned and there's no way to know. When I was telling my dad about this episode, he said that wine should have a sell-by date. I like the thinking, but the problem is that there's no reliable way to know when or even if any of these faults will happen in a wine. And something like ropiness will eventually work itself out. When? There's no way to know. When I had tasted these faults, it was during a presentation of natural wines from a distributor. Even they admitted that this is a real issue. They know that certain producers have a higher incidence of these things like mouse and rope. And they have a general idea when ropiness will occur and how long it takes to disappear, but it's not an exact science. The only way to know is to open a bottle from time to time. And the thing is, they know for the ropiness, they know that the wine will eventually have ropiness. So they keep opening the wine until the ropiness presents itself. And then they keep opening more wines until there's no more ropiness. It's weird. It's a waste of wine. So all these issues can be solved with some extra work, the lazy part, and good sanitation, the dirty part. A reasonable dose of SO2 at bottling will go a long way to ensuring a wine will be shelf stable for years. You know what else will help? Time. Rushing to bottle a wine within a few months of fermentation increases the likelihood of faults, allowing the complex chemical reactions that are never ending in a wine to reach some kind of stability will mitigate these issues, not eliminate completely, but will lessen them. From ancient times to a few hundred years ago, we've had to deal with many of these issues, especially oxidation. Wine stayed in a barrel and would be transferred to some kind of animal skin for personal use. Taverns and homes would just tap the barrel. With that much wine, it could take a very long time to oxidize, and that oxidized wine was near the top. Bottling happened at the final destination and not the winery. That concept didn't become common until about a hundred-ish years ago. A truly natural wine, if there can be a definition, would be one where nothing happens in the vineyard or the winery. Just pick the grapes, extract the, the juice, let it ferment, and then bottle it. The reality is that wine made this way is destined to spoil in some way. And while most of the drinking public thinks that this is what happens, the reality is that we have to at least nudge a wine to get it to be something that can be transported to a retail shelf or a restaurant table. I have nothing as natural wine. I just want to make sure we all understand the reality of it. It can be super tasty, super funky, even super nasty. I find that this uncertainty is the biggest obstacle to get over. These winemakers are trying to have the lowest impact possible in making this delicious beverage. And while I may think they're knuck and futz, sometimes I get where they're coming from. At the end of the day, you and I and the average consumer expects to be able to open a bottle of wine with a high expectation it's fault free. So that's going to do it for this episode. I hope you got value from this episode. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe and then tell your friends. Until next time, we're going to wrap it all up next time. That's what we're going to do next time. <laughs>